Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm Corey Heights, and I'm the founder of Prep Athletics. And on today's episode, I am pleased to announce that we have the head coach of Worcester Academy in Worcester, Massachusetts, Coach Jamie Sullivan. And Jamie's been at Worcester Academy since 1998. He became the head coach in 2011 after being an assistant since 2000. And he's placed players at programs at all levels to include schools such as Villanova, Florida State, Texas A&M, George Washington, Iowa, uh, Bryant, and many, many more. Uh, The Worcester Academy program has also produced NBA players, and two head coaches currently in the NBA are graduates, uh, Rick Carlisle of the Dallas Mavericks and Mike Malone of the Denver Nuggets. Jamie, welcome very much to the show. Oh, thanks, Corey. Really appreciate it. Great introduction, and um, you know, really excited uh, to be here and um, spend some time with you. You know, you've been a huge part of um, over the last five or six or seven years of helping us get players here at Worcester Academy and Prep Athletics has done such a good job with it. Yeah, well, I appreciate those kind words. And the reason we met, Jamie, is because when I started figuring out that I wanted to learn more about prep schools, I started combing all of my college contacts. And I said, hey, if I was to visit three prep schools in New England, which three would you, would you recommend? Because I was planning a road trip to actually see these places in person and meet guys like you in person. And there were three schools that about every coach recommended. That was Northfield Mount Hermon and John Carroll, St. Thomas More with Jerry Quinn and Worcester Academy with you. So you made that first cut and that was not me picking blindly. That was based on college coach recommendations. So you've got a lot of respect out there in that world. Well, I appreciate it. And we've had such unbelievable coaches and players that come through here. And I've been very fortunate to work for guys like, um, you know, Ed Riley and Mo Cacera. And then obviously our legendary coaches, uh, D. Rowe and, and Tom Blackburn, two of the, two of the legends here. Um, you, uh, you, you take the tradition in, in the basketball program here uh, very seriously because it's something to behold. And um, you have to find the right players and find the right families that, that, that can match with that. And so a lot of college coaches know when the kids come to Worcester Academy over the last 50, 60, 70, 80 years, um, they're going to be prepared socially and emotionally because they live on campus. They're going to be prepared academically, most importantly. And then the league that we play in um, and the schedule and the, um, that, that, that we put out every year, it, it, it demonstrates that the, that, that the boys are going to be ready to play at the college level as well. Um, and, and, you know, we, ha- we have that tradition that we're really lucky for. And um, it's something that, you know, like I said, I don't take very lightly. Yeah, and one of the things I noticed in that first visit is when I walk in the gym and there, uh, you're busy talking to college coaches, which you need to do, but there's Dan Sullivan. And I met one of the best assistant coaches in New England, and Dan and I have been friends ever since. And the other thing I noticed besides Dan and, and, and how he's just one of the best assistants out there is that we weren't, you guys weren't playing in, in the newer gym. You guys were playing in your old sweat box, and it was a hot day. There was, it was, it, the gym stunk like, you know, teenage boy sweat. Guys were on that sideline injured. Every 20 minutes you had to stop and someone was bleeding or twisted an ankle or, or got an elbow to the eye. And it was rough. And I made a mental note that day. Okay, if I'm ever going to send a player to Coach Sullivan, he has to be able to battle and, and deal with, with these rougher conditions. And it's not rough in a bad way. It's just it's the way college game is played, right? It's physical. And the only other school just off the top of my head that's like that is Hargrave, right? They take a certain type of – of you know junkyard dog kid as well in their program so tell me is that the tradition that's always been at, at your in your program or is that something you um you promote or tell me about that 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 just grittiness you guys have and where it comes from well you know being a being an assistant coach for 13 years and waiting in line to to become a head coach on top of um you know growing up here in Worcester uh second largest city in New England um, I didn't grow up with a with a lot Right. I didn't go. I grew up in this neighborhood where the school is, but I didn't go to school here. My parents didn't go to school here. My grandparents, my great grandparents, all these people that grew up on Vernon Hill, we didn't get to go to school here. But ultimately, during the time that um, I was an assistant coach, Doc Samco, who was the legendary trainer, again, D. Rowe and Tom Blackburn, 
you know, the old school guys, those are the ones that I really got along with. Um, and D row being from Worcester growing up, um, here, like I did, it, it just, it kind of shaped my personality as a, as a coach coming up through the ranks, starting in youth hoop basketball, going to AAU basketball, all the while still coaching here, but to find guys that, that, that have my personality. And that's why Dan Sullivan and myself really mix good because he's, he's not like me. He's, he's, he's a very, you know, down to earth, you know, very, uh, a family oriented, not that I'm not, but I, I'm more of a guy that, you know, I had to fight and claw to get to where I was. It wasn't like I was handed this job, um, you know, being a teenage parent uh, at 15 years old, having to go to college at nighttime to get my degree. So I could become a teacher. I drove a fork truck for 10 years. So I always was, I always look for guys that um, have something to prove um, that aren't afraid to get their, to get their nose dirty, uh, get their hands dirty, if you will. And um, I, I like, I like guys that play with a chip on their shoulders. So yeah, you're right. It is what we do here. Um, and you know that now because you send us players and that's why, you know, a young man, it's, he's, uh, that, that we're trying to get to come to school here, former football player, uh, uh, under recruited, under I, I like those guys. And, and I've made, uh, won a lot of games because we will out tough people. Um, we will out grind them. We will get up underneath their chin and, 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 and make them work for everything they got to do. And yeah, that's kind of what we've done here. Um, and it, it stands been an integral part of, um, of it because I knew that I needed to get a full-time head coach, uh, mm -hmm. sorry, assistant coach, uh, being a full-time head coach. I knew I needed to get a full-time assistant coach, somebody that could work on the campus, somebody that's young, that's going to be able to, you know, grab hold of the grassroots programs here because AAU is really big up, excuse me, up in New England. And Dan has done that. So it's, it's a, we're, we're a really good team for that. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go back a little bit. You grew up in the neighborhood, but why did you gravitate towards basketball and not another sport? Yeah. My great grandfather was a professional baseball player. Um, but my father worked after school and night programs in the uh, projects here in Greybrook Valley and in Lincoln Village. So I, lo I, lo I learned to love rap music and basketball. Um, I was way better in baseball. I, 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 was, I was a great baseball player. I just didn't love it. Basketball, the culture of it, the, 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 the uh, ability to, you know, to, to be in a place sometimes that I wasn't comfortable because I, when I go to certain gyms, I, they know that I'm a coach. And, um, you know, my father uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, put us in positions where we were the minority, right? Like we're in gyms, or in, at, in classrooms, uh, at, at these schools where it was, um, you know, population was Latino, uh, um, you know, uh, people of color, and then Vietnamese. And, and my father really made us become culturally competent. And that was one of the things that I really loved about basketball because it's a worldwide sport now. And I, I love going to Switzerland or England and finding people that uh, are, are part of a different culture or a different country, but they have the same passion that I have for the game of basketball. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of growing up in the neighborhood and then, and then, gravitating towards the park where we would play all the time right up here in Vernon Hill Park right over near Gasco Field where we have our fields and I wasn't permitted on Gasco Field back then but um being able to be in the park was where I where I really loved in basketball unlike baseball is a sport you can practice on your own so I would shovel the driveway I would I would shovel the walkways I would go up to the park and shovel the shovel the park so I could shoot hoops in the snow and nobody could tell me I couldn't do it. All I needed was a basketball. So that's probably the other reason too. Right. Oh, that's great. Tell me about your pitch. You know, we all know every prep school has its own flavor. They've got different academic profiles, different culture, different basketball styles. What's your pitch to families when they call you up and say, hey, I know you're looking at me, coach. Why should we come to Worcester Academy? What do, what do you say to them? Well, we have three full-time coaches that work here, first and foremost, myself. Uh, Dan Sullivan and Ed Riley, who's a New England Hall of Famer. Um, academically, we're going to challenge you. You're going to get challenged socially and emotionally, living away from home, being in the dorms. But ultimately, 
the best part about our school is we're in the city. So you can access a city, the second largest city, like I said, in New England. Um, and, and not only are you going to be living here, but you're also able to access the city outside. You're an hour away from Boston. You're an hour away from Providence. You're an hour away from Hartford. Um, so your family can fly in and come. Uh, and, and we have a good day population, day student population, 320 kids. So ultimately, whether it be like uh, 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 Jack Zimmerman came from New Hampshire, he was a seven day boarder. Uh, his roommate was Olaf. Olaf was from Sweden. He was the hockey goalie. Olaf and Jack became best of friends. And when Olaf needed a place to go, he'd go to Jack's house or you know, uh, Tanner Johnson, when he came here, Tanner became best friends with kids that lived right here in Worcester. So on the weekends, when you're a little homesick or you're, you're uh, you know, you want a home cooked meal, you want to do your laundry. A lot of times our players become friends with kids that live here and that, that are day students. So they become part of their families. So that's a huge pitch for us to be able to access the city to have a day population where our uh, families that are far away, they have the opportunity to know, oh, well, uh, you know, your roommate's a five day boarder and lives an hour away. And, you know, he's gonna go, you're gonna go to, you know, Johnny's house to hang out, whether it be Johnny lives down the Cape or somebody lives, it, it just, that has become a huge aspect of it. And we treat it a lot like a high school program, Corey, where we're heavily involved with the, with, with the kids, obviously, but the families, we spend a lot of time with the families. We do a lot of stuff in the um, spring, in the summer. We do stuff over the summer with our camps that we're gonna be putting on. Um, we play in a, um, a team camp at Assumption College right here. So we spend a couple of weekends with our team. They work our basketball camp. Um, and that's time that we get to spend together. And we have a, a lot of former players, families that again, they live by here. They have cookouts for us. Um, we go swimming and we do things um, like a high school program, but we are a prep school program. So that's kind of the major thing is the academic piece, um, you know, the social emotional growth that they're going to have. And I always say to him, Corey, basketball takes care of itself because we play in the best league in the country. We play 32 games a year. We practice 60 times. We have, you know, uh, 25 workouts in front of college coaches. It, it, basketball is going to take care of itself. It's all the other things. And I want boys, players to come here, Corey, and not just be basketball players. I want them to become an integral part of our student body. Um, I want them to push themselves academically. I want them to push themselves socially. Um, and, and it's, we do a lot of community service too, because we're right here in the city. So we developed the wagon program. Uh, Worcester Academy gives others nourishment. We bring all of our leftover food to soup kitchens. We donate a lot of time to the Union Hill School, which is across the street. 99% of the kids are on free or reduced lunch there. We spend a lot of time doing uh, uh, candy drives and can drives and Christmas presents. So th there's a whole slew of things that we do uh, that are important to me to take care of this neighborhood and to take care of the families that live in and around. And I implore that with my basketball program. Uh, I should say our basketball program. And that is one of the things that is most important to me is, is, is giving back to the neighborhood that I grew up in um, from the school that's been sitting here for a long time that a lot of Worcester people didn't get to access. Right, and I think that's one of your biggest attributes is that, yeah, all these places you can get better at basketball, get great academics. But it comes down to one, coaching. I think that's a very important part of uh, how a kid picks a school. And two, I just love how you do the community service. And when you do mention that to families, when I mention it to families, you can see them perk up a little bit because they don't, don't just want their kids sitting around thinking about themselves, thinking about college. They want them to have that giving back, especially in the neighborhood where the school is located. So to me, I think that's just a great attribute you have. And it's, it's, it's a win-win for everybody involved. So It is, Corey. It really is. And it's it's... It, you, you say it and I say it, we're giving, you're not giving, you're getting so much more. You get, you don't, you, like the time that we spend down at the soup kitchen on Wednesday mornings at six o'clock in the morning and somebody comes, somebody comes walking in that I went to high school with that's now struggling with drugs and they see me become vulnerable. I'm upset. My niece was there. She's, she, she was sick. And my team sees me human 
it makes our relationship that much stronger. And, and, you know, the five years of taking care of my dad, I didn't realize, Corey, what I was doing. I was doing what I thought a son should do. But what they, what my boys and families, the feedback that I've gotten from that, that's what it, that's what a basketball coach is all about. And that's what Jerry Quinn's all about. You know, John Carroll, these guys, uh, uh, um, and when my dad passed his 10, 10 coaches that are in our league that showed up to the wake. And that's about respect, Corey. And, you know, you're not going to always love what I do, but I'm going to be a gentleman because I have to be here uh, at Worcester Academy. I'm going to be a fierce competitor. But when the, when the, when the, when the lights are, uh, are shut off and we're walking out of that gym, some of these coaches that I coach against have some of my best friends in the world. Um, and that's one of the things that people don't understand. It's kind of like the way that the Big East was formed. Um, those coaches became so close. We are close because what we care about is getting our kids to college. And if we can get our kids to college and they can go for free and we can win a couple games in between, maybe get a championship, uh, that's, <laughs> that's what we try to do. And we help each other do it, you know? Right. That's that's a key. Is it's it's a team effort. If a kid need or a coach needs help placing a kid, and you've talked to a coach that needs a guy at that position, you'll help each other out. And that's one thing I want want you to touch on too, which I've not asked a coach before, based in New England, but I think it's worth talking about. Is sometimes when I talk to families, they're like, well, "Why, why do I want to send my kid to New England? Like, why do I want to send him there and not to a place in the West Coast?" And I try to explain, well, you know, one, that's where all the, a lot of the prep schools are located that have been around a while, and two you're in close proximity to so many colleges. Tell me the benefit of your location within the college basketball world. Well, it's just got such a tradition, right? Like, uh, like I said, 50, 60, 70 years, the tradition of they know when the kids come from Worcester Academy or New England prep school, they're going to be prepared again, academically right away. Um, they're going to be prepared socially and emotionally because they lived away from home. They've already lived away from home. You know what I mean? And the tradition of, of 180 years, 185 years, the school's been in business. Um, they're going to know that they're qualified. They, 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 they're going to know that basketball is always going to be uh, something that we focus in on. We're not going away. Some of these schools or uh, academies or whatever they call them that pop up all over the country, West Coast, South, wherever, they, they're one or two investments away, uh, bad investments away from going under. Our school's not going to go under. Our school's going to be here long after I'm here. And it's the, it, it is like a tra the tradition. And because we're so clustered, um, like Worcester Academy, we're right in the middle of the state. We're centrally located. We don't travel more than two and a half hours because we're so centrally located. But the, the college coaches that can come in and go to Worcester Academy on Tuesday, and then they drive to Wilbraham and Munson an hour away Tuesday night, and then Wednesday morning they're at Williston, Northampton. Then Wednesday afternoon they're at such and such school, and Wednesday night they can hit ten schools in the three or four or five day period. Um, and, and and that's just the way that it goes. It's it's um, it's it's just it's just it's um, you know something that. I think that we are able to be able to service that and the college coaches know that it's one stop shopping. Yeah. Really, Corey, that's ultimately what it is. And what I love, let's do the personal example. The first player I placed there, Tanner Johnson. So one of the best players in the state of Kentucky from my alma mater of Lexington Catholic High School. And his only offers at that time were to go to prep school for a military academy. We get him at Worcester. And since Bryant University is 45 minutes away, they saw him a few times during just the first couple of weeks of playing in open gyms, bam, they offered him, bam, he signed. So that would not have happened. And that's not just Kentucky. That's Colorado where I live now. There's just all these coaches cannot take the bandwidth, money, and time to come out here to see one kid in one practice. They're going to get the most bang for their buck, which is what you just mentioned, traveling all around these open gyms during the fall and getting to see so many good qualified kids who are academically prepared, who have been away from mom and dad, and it's why, you know, the East Coast prep schools are just are just built for this. And it's no guarantee. I just want to make no. that clear. There's no guarantee you're going to spend this money, spend this time and get the level you want. But you will be seen and you will have a prep school coach who's connected at all levels advocating for you from the minute you sign with them. And talk to me about that. When a kid signs with you, right? Let's say you signed uh, between March 10th and April 10th after the letters went out. Tell me what your process is and how you start 
talking to the family and the kid about the next steps for recruiting? So, so pre pandemic, um, we would just start right away with, um, you know, before the pandemic, we'll, we're going to have in, in the month of June, we have our, our clinic here for the kids in the neighborhood. So I implore, no matter where our kids are from, Corey, I want, I want my guys to come. Um, because the month of June, 22, 23, 24, we have a clinic here. That's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 25, 26, 27. We're, we're like really hoping that we're going to put on a prep school basketball camp in front of college coaches. Uh, we're working on those dates where we could be one of the only coaches associations um, out of all the state associations that are going to pull this together. We got NEPSAC approval. Um, we're waiting on approval from the NCAA. So that would right there. So they would come in and then I could right away in the month of June, which usually is two weeks, evaluate and start to, re excuse me, start to figure out first and foremost, what level they are, what level I think they are. And then I'd start contacting coaches because ultimately, Corey, we don't give out the scholarships, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's the college coaches. And a lot of college coaches, um, they want to know, oh, who's recruiting them? Who's offered them? Well, why don't you offer them? And it's always, once you get that first offer, um, then it usually goes you know, starts to spiral and go downhill for you. But to get that first offer, like for Tanner Johnson, particularly, um, they needed a shooter. And he got that offer and you're going to go to college $70,000 a year for free. Like you got to really think hard and look at it hard. I like to look at multiple schools, um, specifically when kids have multiple offers. But when Tanner went and visited there, he loved it. So that's why he went. Um, but the recruiting process and everybody loves the R word. Every parent loves my kids getting recruited. It starts with them trusting us because college coaches are not going to talk to parents um, in, until they know the kid's good enough. Right. And then they'll talk to the parents, but they, they can get turned off by parents that are too involved, that are sending too many emails uh, that, that are, that are too involved. Like it's happened before where you, you have parents that are too involved. And they almost scare away college coaches because college coaches don't want to deal with that. They got to concentrate on winning games. So for us, the, the, the recruiting process starts April, May into June. And then once we start these camps and uh, then, then we go from there. And again, that's where Dan Sullivan comes into play because the AAU coaches and the AAU teams, these kids play for Dan, Dan is in charge of uh, making sure that he knows those guys uh, and make sure that the guys are being used wisely. Dan's in charge of scheduling. Dan's the associate head coach here, Corey. Like, you know, and I'm not afraid to, I'm not afraid to say it. Like he's an integral part of it. He is an integral part in recruiting as well because he is on the phone just like I am constantly talking to coaches. I've had two coaches call while we're sitting here on this call. You know what I mean? Just wanting to talk about our players. And during COVID, how has placement gone for your guys? So hard, Corey. It's really hard. We have, we have a, a two division one players, in my opinion. Um, one of them had three or four offers, but you know, again, everybody says, Oh, I got offers. Offers don't mean anything, Corey. When people put it on Twitter and on their Instagram, it doesn't mean anything until the head coach calls your mom or your dad and really wants to come, come out and visit you, or they want you to come visit the school. People throw out offers constantly and they, they're not binding uh, uh, agreements or contracts. It, they're just verb verbiage. Um, so we have two kids, one we're trying to get as a walk on at a division two, and we're trying to get the other one a division two scholarship. If you can even imagine a six foot three, uh, a kid that can, you know, jumps 40 inches and can shoot threes and he was a division one player. And now we're begging to get him a division two scholarship. It's just crazy with, you know, however many people in the portal, 2000, whatever it is. It just, it's, it's insane, man. It's been hard, Corey. And based on this difficulty you've had, uh, placing these kids, has it changed what kind of player you're looking to take in the future now post COVID? You know, I don't think so. I, we, we've, we've gone young and stayed young. We like young players. Uh, we like guys are going to be here for two and three and four years. And so I, I, I'm not going away from that. I'm, I'm going, um, uh, with players that are going to make us better. Um, and they're going to be able to show themselves in front of college coaches. Cause you can guarantee Corey in September and October, um, if everything goes according to plan, I, we're going to have to take like notes or, or I should say take reservations for college coaches because it's going to be insane. You because think so? Not, yeah. They're not going to go visit high schools. 
they're going to come visit the schools that have all the players. Do you know what I mean? Like they always do, but it's going to flock even more. So you, you predict this year, let's say everything's opened up back to normal. You think more schools that maybe haven't been in, you know, because every year you see the same schools. I mean, obviously the East Coast schools are coming there, New England schools, but you see kind of the same West Coast schools coming through doing their rounds. Do you think more schools are going to start looking at the prep school world or do you think JUCO is going to take off more or do, are they going to still be waiting for transfers? What do you predict? I, I think that the coach, college coaches are going to come out and see because they're going to be anxious, right? Like they haven't been able to go out and watch players. So if you're a hungry recruiter and you want to get your eyes on live basketball, you're going to come out and watch. That's my opinion. So I would say that there's going to be more schools, more coaches coming out. Yeah, my two cents is every program in America should have an assistant coach make the rounds for one week a year in New England. Oh, there's no question about it. And the ones that do, the Gardner-Webbs and some of these ones that, are, that like Gardner-Webb has won so many, so many games down there because they take prep school kids constantly. Texas State, that's a random school in Texas that has a, half their rosters, prep school kids, right? Well, and guess go. what? Every kid doesn't want to stay in New England either, right? No, they don't. They don't. <laughs> For the weather, no way. It's crazy. Let me ask you this. Guards. I, I, I love talking to coaches about guards. I, I do not have a good eye on what a, a, a D1 guard is versus a D2 versus D1, D2. There's such a, there's such a fine line between – uh, you know, their abilities and everything. So how do you recruit guards and what do you look for uh, when you're trying to fill your program with that position? Yeah. I mean, the ability to shoot the basketball, right. That's one of them. Um, a heady player, like a coach on the floor in good size, positional size is always a huge thing, but I'm not afraid of smaller guards. I'm not, I never have been. Um, I love a good little water bug that, that drives the other opposing point guard crazy because he's going to guard him uh, 94 feet from the basket. Um, so yeah, I, 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 you know, the ability to shoot good positional size, being able to be like a coach on the floor, um, and be coachable. Like, you know, you, 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 you want to be able to try and get your guards, um, where I like to play sometimes two and three and four guards. It's, it's become that style game. You look at Baylor won the national championship. They, you know, they had three, three, four really good guards. Uh, Villanova, all, all these schools, they always have really good guards. But it's just, it's, it's about, a, it's about a, a, a young guy or a guy that's got a good head on their shoulders and that is coachable, Corey. And that's ultimately what I look for when I'm looking for guards. Right. Let me ask you, let's go back to college recruiting real quick and helping your players. You know, Tanner Johnson, the reason we mentioned Tanner is because we both are connected to him, but you know, he picked the only school or the first school that reached out and recruited him and offered him. You say you like your kids to have options when your kids have options, no matter what level it is, what advice do you give them? Do you have kind of like a, a philosophy on picking a school? You know, Corey, it's, it's hard because we don't get to go officially visit the schools with the kids. So you 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 rely on your relationship with the coaches, um, and and one thing that you, you got to do it's like buying a car you got to look at multiple cars. It's the same advice I give to the kids and the families when it comes to college recruitment. But the advice that I give them is where do you feel most comfortable? You know, like where where is it that you felt um, that you belonged? You know, where do you where, where, where what about your teammates? What are they like? You know, because you can go to some schools and the, 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 the team, um, you know, you, you're being recruited by the Big 12, uh, such and such uh, league, Power 5 league, and they're in the middle to the bottom of that league. Um, you, when you come back and you tell me, oh, we went to parties and we were doing it, that, that team's not going to win. You know, so uh, uh, what's most important to you? And a lot of guys will say winning, so you've got to try and help them find that winning program. And that was Daryl Reynolds when um, he went to Villanova, right? Daryl Reynolds could have went to Utah. He could have went to, uh, well, he went to Nova um, and he could have went to South Carolina. Those are the three schools that he visited. During the course of that time, Villanova won a national championship. He was on that team. Utah made the sweet 16. He would have been on that team. And South Carolina made the final four. So he had three really good choices. Um, and he chose uh, Nova. And he became him, Josh Hart, uh, and I forget the other guy's Chris name. Jenkins. Jenkins. They are the winningest class of all time at Villanova. And I tell Daryl all the time, because we still speak, 
you're going to be the mayor of Philadelphia someday if you want to. And so like, that's some of the advice that I give about the, um, about college recruitment. Yeah. Gotcha. That's good advice. Um, let's go to the current state of affairs, the transfer portal. Um, what are your thoughts on that transfer rule that's going on right now? You know, it's just crazy. It's sad for the high school kids. We've seen it benefit some of our former players. Uh, Kevin Maffo transferred from Quinnipiac to Texas A&M. Uh, because he gets an extra year, he's going from Texas A&M back to Quinnipiac, if you can even imagine that. <laughs> um, Is that a first, do you think? Yeah, probably. But it's just, it's important. He wanted to go back to the coach that he felt most comfortable with. Um, it, it's happening in prep school, too. It's unfortunate, Corey, because you have families and kids when that going gets tough, they jump ship. And that's not always what you want to teach your children. You know, you want to teach them to dig their heels in and, and, and try and fight and battle. But every time there's 2,000 people in that portal, because either the going got tough and they think the grass is greener somewhere else. So they think that they better than they are, even though the coach that recruited them was the only one that gave them that opportunity. Um, you know, it's just crazy. It's, 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 it's in, I don't even really put too much merit, put too much time to think about it because I got to just try and concentrate on my guys. It's, it's, it's insanity. Let's just say that. Well, based on that, if you were a uh, King for a day for the NCAA, what changes would you make to help your kids out? Or just for to make the game better in general. I just think that you know, you know, similar to like, you know, when when you transferred, you, you had to sit out a year, and you had to sit out. That's it, and that deterred a lot, a lot of a, a, a less number of people to transfer. Um, and what's really happening is is the, the the low major and the mid major programs are like tryouts for the high major programs, and you know. Do you want to become player of the year at your conference, have an opportunity to play in the NCAA tournament, you know, like at Loyola Chicago and some of these other programs? Or do you want to, you want to like, you know, play a couple of years and then jump ship and go play at Kentucky? Like, I, I don't, I just don't agree with it. I think if, if, if you're comfortable and you really enjoy your coach and you like where you're at, that's where you stay. Yeah. Let's go into some personal questions here. Uh, over your time at Worcester Academy, who's the biggest surprise you've had as a player who's come in and just exceeded expectations. Oh God. Because sometimes you'll just see a film. You'll never see the kid in person and he shows up on campus and you think you know what you're getting, but what's the instance where it's like, wow, he's way better than, than advertised. There was a kid that it wasn't when I was head coach, but I was assistant coach. His name was Chris Hayes. He was, he's from California. And um, he came in, he's six, five, six, five kid. Um, he'd be in the gym and he'd be like doing defensive slides at six in the morning and it wasn't the fleetest footy guy, but really could shoot. He was, he was terrific and he deserved every aspect uh, from, from that standpoint. Um, Jimmy Barron Jr. was another one where, you know, his father's the head coach at URI and that's why he's going to school there. I had recruited him and developed a relationship with him since he was a sophomore in high school. Um, and then he came to Worcester Academy and again, we had the open gyms and all of a sudden there was like, oh boy. And then we go down to the war on the shore a tournament and Jimmy has 38 and 39 and 37 and three games and everybody in the country is like, so he's got to come to us. I'm like, dude, you, you guys missed a boat. He already signed. He's going to his father. But everybody thought that he was going to his father because he wasn't good enough to go anywhere else. But I don't want to say that he surprised me, but he surprised a lot of people. And then obviously played 13 years in the, in, in, in the professional ranks overseas. So those are a couple of guys that just, uh, again, like they just willed themselves to get into the position where they, where they were, you know, just continuously willed Austin. Car we, we had, we've had so many Austin Carroll, another one played at Rutgers. Yeah. So just so many great players that, that as a coach, that's your job. It's to believe in them. And, and, and help them dream past their own dreams. And that's important to me because like, again, to tell you, Corey, that I would be sitting here having a podcast with you out in Colorado, being the head coach at Worcester Academy. If I told you that 25 years ago, I would have I been, you know, I would have felt like I was lying to you, so. 
You would have said, what's a podcast and who's Corey? <laughs> yeah, right. There you go. <laughs> uh, what's the biggest win of your career as a head coach? Oh, God. You know, I, I would say last year when we beat Mike Hart. Mike Hart is uh, at St. Andrews School. He's like one of my best friends. Um, we beat him in the playoffs, and I hadn't won a playoff game. We were 0 for 6 in the playoffs. So we ended up winning two. We lost in the championship game, but I would say that's one of the biggest wins um, that we've had. I'll be sure to let Mike know that. <laughs> oh, yeah, he, he knows. How about the best player you ever coached against? Best player I ever coached against? Rashad McCants, no questions asked. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, kid from North Carolina. Best high school player I've ever seen. Luau Dang and Charlie Villanova were very good too. Uh, but but. McCants was a man amongst boys. He, he single-handedly beat us three or four times. His high school teammate was Wes Miller, who just took the Cincinnati job. Um, we, we, we couldn't beat him. We couldn't beat him. He had 39, uh, 39 in the championship game at Clark University versus us. We had Craig Smith and Jared Jack, among others, Brendan Winters and, and Jason Jack. We had eight Division One players, and that dude – was a man amongst boys. There was four or 5,000 people there, everybody cheering for Worcester Academy. And that dude just flat out beat us. So yeah, it's not even, I, Rashad McCants is like, it wasn't even close. Like he was just a man amongst boys. And you know, we, we coached against Drummond and he, he can go up and down the list. No one's Noel, the best shot blocker I've ever seen, you know, besides Sean Williams at BC. Yeah, so like you, you could, you could go up and down the list of, the best players, but I would have to say Rashad McCants. Okay. What's your favorite movie of all time? Um, I remember the Titans. <laughs> I, I love that movie. I, I love uh, sport um, and how sport can, can make you be so culturally competent because you don't care. What you care about is, is being with your teammates. You know, right. I love that. I love that movie and a great, great album from that movie. What, has it got a bunch of old, old hits from the 60s? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Lastly, uh, when you're not coaching, what are your hobbies? You know, I love to spend time with my family. Um, I love to travel, and, and I love to boat. I have a fishing boat, um, and that's what I love to do. So, yeah, boating is my, my big thing. Where's it, uh, where's it docked? It's docked up in Hampton Beach, New Hampshire. So okay. I was up there yesterday. It's not in the water yet. So... Gotcha. Well, Jamie, thanks so much for coming on today. I know we learned a lot and I think you shared some great information about uh, your I, background, your school, yeah, the prep school world and, and your thoughts. And I just think it's valuable. And I hope a lot of people uh, listen to this and, and get some good tidbits from it. So I appreciate you. You're a good friend and yeah. uh, can't wait to keep doing this with you throughout the future. Oh, same here, bud. And I can't wait to see you and, and give those two little girls a big hug for me. All right. All right I, haven't, well, I haven't had the opportunity to meet your children. Someday I will. That's the most important thing is, is the relationships that you have through this wonderful game. And that's the thing that I say, one last thing I'll say is that's what I say to parents is I want to, I want to go to your son's wedding and I want to hold their children. Like that's what's most important to me is the relationships um, throughout basketball. So we have a great one here and uh, I look forward to talking to you soon, bud. All right. Thanks so much, Jamie. That was the Prep Athletics Podcast. Thanks so much for uh, joining in with me today. Uh, if you like this, go ahead and subscribe on YouTube or uh, any of the major podcasting platforms, and that way you'll never miss an episode. So thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you all next time. See you, buddy.